Okay, so I mentioned already uh, that uh, for almost every monad there is a way of escaping the monad. So eventually, you know, we, we work with these monadic values using bind or the do notation, right? And, and, and every time we do something, we get as a result another monadic value. So there's always, a, I mean, the return of bind is another monadic value. The return of return is another monadic value. So all these operations that we do monadically, they always end up producing another monadic value. So at some point, probably, we would like to have the real result, right? Of course, except for the I.O. moment, where we never get the real result. <laughs> Uh, but for every other monad, there is a way of getting it. It's not, because it's different for every monad, it cannot be part of the definition of a monad. So some ways of extracting the value from a monad is, uh, let's say, pattern matching. Right? If you have a maybe monad, well, then eventually you end up pattern matching it to nothing or just, and then continue calculation with the value that was inside just. Right? So you escape the maybe monad, and now you are just pure calculations. Yes? So, so just, just to clarify your, your earlier point, you, you said that, there, that there's, no way, there's no way to put in the, the signature of a monad that there is a way to get the value up. But I thought that that was the extract operation of the co-monad. Yes, but okay. we are not talking about a common. Okay. No, no, common okay. is like, you know, dual to monad. So okay. So what what you're saying is that we, we don't have this operation in, in monads. Not that it's impossible to represent it in the type system. No. Okay. Got it. Mm -hmm. Right. So so you know, commonads are a special class in which you have to have the extract operation, right? That's part of the definition of common. Got it. The definition of monad is no, you can. Th there are lots of monads that have different ways of extracting information, and they are totally different. Some of the monads are also commonads, and they have both. But there is a certain overlap. But in general, they are different classes. Okay. So. There is a way of pattern matching. Uh, maybe is pattern matched. Either is pattern matched to left, right, right? And we extract the value. Um, for these monads where um, the monadic value is actually a function, like the reader monad or uh, the state monad, we actually have to execute it. You have, we have to run it. So, so we have external functions that no, are not part of the monad definition, but they are defined for this particular data structure, there is, there is a, f these functions are usually called run, when, when, when we are dealing with functions, right? So you, you run a function, so you, you have run uh, reader, right? Run reader will take uh, the environment right, and uh, and the reader and will produce some value, right? And the implementation is really trivial. Run reader of oh some environment, this is a value now, and now we are pattern matching reader. That's, that's the data constructor, this is a type constructor, this is a data constructor. Data constructor takes a function. And what do we do here? Well, we just apply this function to E. So it's just simply applying the function to the and, and every time we, you know, 
we run a reader, we can provide a different environment and we'll get a different result, right? But the difference is in the environment, not in the uh, monadic calculation that produced this reader. This reader was produced always the same, okay? But you can call it with different environments and you will get different results. So this is a way of, of getting out of the model and finally accessing the value by applying this function. Okay? So that's the hidden value of type A that we can access by applying the function to the environment. We access this value that's hidden in the monad as a return value of the function. And the same thing is, maybe I, I won't write it, but run state uh, takes a state and a state value. Well, I can use my right to because it's the same at fs, right? You just apply this function to, to state, and but what it produces now is a pair of some value and the new state. You can discard the state if you want, if you're not interested in, in state, it's fine. Or if you are interested in state, you can discard the value. And I think there are even special functions that do this for you. Uh, Execute, I think. Um, so now, uh, another way of accessing stuff is like when you have a, a list monad, right? What can you do to extract stuff from a list? Uh, okay, that, that's, that's already non-trivial. There are many ways of doing this. You can just say, okay, if, if the list is empty, that means failure of my calculation. If the list is non-empty, then I'll take the head of the list and say this is the value that I was interested in and discard the tail. So that happens when you have these non-deterministic parsers for this list. That's what you do. Or you can fold over the list and extract one value from the whole list. You can like, fold over with some accumulate or some function. So now we'll, you can do the same with trees. Trees are monadic too. And, and finally, there is the I.O. monad. In the I.O. monad, there is no way to, of executing. You just make it main, and then the runtime has some kind of run I.O. with world. Give it a world. OK, so this is, um, why did I introduce these monads? Because uh, now, finally, we can get into Simon Marlowe's book. Because, like, the first thing there starts with, okay, this is a monad, you know, this is a um, eval monad. Um, deal with it, right? Because it's, it's written for advanced Haskell programmers. And now, now we are finally advanced Haskell programmers. Okay, we can add ourselves. <laughs> <laughs> now we can start understanding the book. Okay. But of course, okay, we could start immediately um, doing the book, or I can give you some background. Probably it's it's better. I mean, you you can read the book by yourself, really. But like, he explains how to use this stuff. So it's like engineering book. It tells you how to write code that uses this stuff. But there is a lot of knowledge that's assumed. Some knowledge is assumed that you know, and some other is just something that um, the implementers of Haskell, Haskell know, and, and it was just not included in the book. But, but um, Simon Marlowe wrote a bunch of papers, uh, with Simon Peyton, Peyton Jones and some other people explaining how this whole stuff is implemented. They actually implemented this stuff, so they, they give, give very good explanation. 
how the stuff was implemented and why certain choices were made. Okay. So let me start by um, explaining the title of the book. Okay. Um, why is there parallel and concurrent program? Does everybody know what the difference is between parallel and concurrent programming? Sort of, right? Yeah. But, but let me let me just uh, uh, make it more explicit, right? So, concurrent programming is, is kind of older than parallel programming, at least in, in practice of you know, programming PCs. I mean, people have used all, all kind of stuff on supercomputers, but that was like a separate world. You know, this whole thing came to PCs, and now it's actually available on, on phones, even. So we made a lot of progress. Uh, but concurrency was there even uh, on machines that had a single processor. Okay. Whereas uh, parallelism is the way of using uh, a multi-core or multi-processor computer or a GPU where, where you have lots of execution units right, that can actually run stuff in parallel. So the thing that you use parallelism is different the, your goal is different than, than the use of concurrency. The goal of parallelism is to, to is throughput. How much work can you do per second? How much data you can process per second? Right? So you split your, your program into parallel things and you run them on multi -pro, multiple processors and that speeds up your program. So if you have a, a way of parallelizing your program that uh, theoretically works fine, but if you run it, it actually slows down your program with the, com compared to sequential program, then it's useless, right? That, that you just wasted your time. So when you are designing a parallel programming language or library, you always have to think about performance. Now, with uh, concurrency, this is not about throughput, it's about latency. So, throughput versus latency. Latency is how quickly the program responds to external stimuli, to external events, right? That's very important, for instance, in, in GUI, right? You, you don't like seeing the hourglasses. You, you don't like when you, your uh, computer is not responding or your application is not responding, you know, because, sorry, I'm doing something very important, so I'm ignoring your input or queuing it. You know? And then when it wakes up, you know, it processes this whole queue of commands that you typed in and then you made a mistake because you didn't see, the, the, you didn't have any feedback, right? Another situation in which uh, throughput is, uh, <coughs> latency is very important, low latency is very important, is uh, when you are programming a server that gets you know, events from, from the internet or from LAN or, you know. So it has to quickly respond to these things because the, the client is waiting there, right? If you just, you know, get one message to, to process from one computer and it takes you, you know, half an hour, the other guys in the meanwhile will be completely blocked. This does not necessarily increase uh, your performance or it can decrease your performance even when you structure your program using concurrency because you have to create threads and so on. You know, you have to interact with the operating system, 
So that might actually slow down your, your program, but that's not important. What is important that your program reacts quickly. And the, and the users care very much about latency. It's latency that's like more important, especially in GUI, you know, how fast your program responds is more important than how fast it produces results. Sometimes you have a program that's really slow in producing results, but it responds to your input very quick. Right? So another difference between parallel and concurrent is that parallel actually makes only sense only makes sense on a multiprocessor. Right? Because if you have a single processor, then that's just an overhead. Your, your parallel program on a single processor is, is bound to run slow because there, you, you're adding additional overhead. So it only makes sense if you have multiple processors because then you can speed it up. Right? Remember, throughput is the most important. And from the point of, of the programmer, you know, uh, when you are doing parallel programming, you want to increase performance. You are worried about the performance of, of, of your code. Right? You are optimizing, really. That's optimization. Your program will produce the same stuff, right? But it will produce it faster. Whereas when you are doing concurrent programming, um, what you want is to structure your program differently. So it's easier to think about. Because you don't have to actually use threads if you don't want to don't have to use concurrency you can just you know implement everything by hand and say here I have a big loop you know that takes input from the internet and just uh, picks up one message at a time you know starts processing this message and inside this processing it says oh let me peek at the queue again just in case there's another thing you know you can program it by hand if you want but that's just awful and impossible to test. So, so you use uh, concurrency to structure it. You structure it. You, you produce threads that have a particular task that they know how to perform. Right? They know to, to, how to perform a particular task and if they need some other service now they are done with this task or they need somebody else, they might send a message to another thread and say, hey, this is your specialty, right? Can you do this for me? And then get back to me with the result, right? But you have naturally structured your code between uh, threads. And finally, there is this distinct, there is a uh, distinction that's not really strictly between parallel and concurrent programming. It's sort of a different line of division between programs that are deterministic and programs that are non-deterministic. Right? So, um, like if you are reacting to external input, right, then, then your program is non-deterministic. Like if you have two threads running and they are like asking the third thread to do something, right? Then it depends on the timing. You know, if thread A runs slower and thread B runs faster, then uh, thread B will send the message first. You know, and it will be processed and maybe change the state of the of the third thread. You know, and then the message from the first thread will arrive, or they will arrive in the opposite order, you know, and they will produce a different result. So, so this is concurrent programming is usually non-deterministic. Um, now, parallel programming can be deterministic or non-deterministic. The decision made in implementing parallel programming in Haskell was to make it deterministic. So all programs um, that are parallel, that run parallel in Haskell have this 
wonderful property that they run the same way, produce exactly the same result, whether you run them on a single processor, two processors, or a hundred processors. Okay, so in principle, you can test it on a single processor, and if it runs and it's correct, you know, it will run the same way on multiprocessor. It will produce the same result. The only difference is, of course, speed, right? The throughput on many processors will hopefully run much faster than on a single processor. And that's that's our hope, right? But. It really depends on so many conditions that the only way to write a parallel program that speeds your computation is to actually time it and test it. Have I done it right? Or maybe it's, the granularity is wrong. No. Maybe I should stop parallelizing and, and, and then just run sequential algorithm at some point. And, and you usually do. Right? So it's, it's really a lot of measurement, trial and error when you're writing parallel And of course, concurrent programs are, are a bitch to test, right? <laughs> you know. Is that a technical term? Yeah, that's, that's a technical term. <laughs> OK, so normally people start with um, concurrent, explaining concurrent programs. And then much, much later, they talk about parallelism. You can see several books written about you know, concurrency and parallelism, and they usually start with concurrence. Is it sort of conceptually simpler or simpler to implement? I don't know. So what, what Simon did is he did the opposite. He said, I'm going to start with parallelism, because parallelism is much easier to understand. And in particular, because of this assumption of determinism, it's even easier to understand. And then we can go to um, concurrency, you know, and talk about threads and talk about uh, communication between threads, locking, this kind of stuff. In parallel programming, there is no locking, there is no communication between threads. They just run in parallel and finally produce a result. And of course, there is some kind of communication and some kind of locking behind the scenes, right? Because you, at some point, you have to join all these tasks, the results of these tasks. Uh, but this is done in the system. You don't have to worry about it. And of course, in parallel programming, there's no way to introduce data races. So this is like, Ooh, you know, data races is, is, is the worst thing that can happen in parallel and concurrent program. There are no data races, and there are no low-level data races in Haskell at all, even in concurrent program. You can still find situations in which you know you have like high-level races. You can always write your program in such a way, or you can have deadlocks if you. <laughs> well, who wants that? <laughs> there are ways of programming that you know, don't cause that. So that, that's one explanation why parallelism first. The other explanation is that parallelism and Haskell just love each other. Okay, there is... Haskell is just like wants to be parallel. Like other languages, it's, it's, it's like a, you know, afterthought, and they introduce parallelism by mutilating the language and, and using like macros, you know, macro libraries to introduce parallelism. And, and they, whereas in Haskell, because of laziness, parallelism is right there. Right? Because in Haskell, every computation is turned into this thunk, right? So every computation is represented by a thunk. And it's just a matter of saying, okay, I want this thunk and this thunk and this thunk to be run in parallel. 
that's it. You know? I mean, we don't have automatic parallelism because that's a, that's a really, I don't know, and be complete problem, you know, how to automatically, maybe it's not, but uh, how to automatically parallelize something because it involves a lot of fine tuning. Some programs will run faster or, or slower depending on how many processors are available, right? So there, there's a bunch of trade-offs that it's just simply impossible to automate. At least, no. I mean, maybe Google, if they stop doing the stuff with uh, playing Go, you know, artificial, using artificial intelligence to uh, win some competitions, chess, Go, and so on, you know, maybe if they concentrated more on, on the pro, pro, problems that are really important to us programmers, right? Like how to optimize the program, how to come out with the best optimization, how to come up with best parallelization of the program. I think that would be much less spectacular. <laughs> it would be much better for our collective. Right? So, so there is no automatic parallelism, but there is this, um, what we can do is provide hints in the program, within the language, right? Provide hints to say, I want this particular calculation to run in parallel with this one, because I know, the, I estimated the cost of this. And I know that if I run these two computations in parallel, then actually I will get a speed. Because I'm a human. I think I know. This computer doesn't. doesn't. So now let's, let's talk a little bit about implementation. Okay? Because uh, Simon does not write about implementation this book. He wrote several papers about it you know, because he was one of the implementers. Uh, but I think as engineers we are always curious about how does this thing work, right? <clears throat> so as I said, everything is a thunk, right? So when you when the programmer says I want to run this thunk in parallel, you can just take a pointer to this thunk and put it in a queue of things to be run in parallel. That's essentially it. You know, you, you create this, this special queue where you put the pointers to these tongues that you want to do run in parallel. <clears throat> and then uh, processors, when they are idle, they just pick something from this queue and run it. If all processors are busy, then okay, then you know, this stuff will eventually be calculated in the program when the need arises, right? <clears throat> but if programmer says, I want this to be run, no, it, it's not that I want this to be run. It's possible, it's okay to run it in parallel. If you can, please run it in parallel. If you can't, it's fine. So if this program runs on a single processor, nothing will be run in parallel, right? But it's okay. Yes? Does that actually guarantee that a given thunk will only be evaluated once? No. I'll, I'll, I'll get to this. It is sort of half guaranteed. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so these thumbs that are put on this uh, queue are called sparks. So these pointers to, to the thumbs, you know, they're called sparks. So what the programmer does, it says, I want this, yeah, I want to spark this thing to run in parallel. I want to spark that thing to run in parallel, and so on. And all these thumbs go on the screen, right? Now, <clears throat> if you go deeper into the implementation, then um, you find out that um, the best way to do this is to make a queue per processor. 
So for every processor or every core that you have on your machine, Haskell uh, creates a data structure. And this data structure, among other things, contains this queue of sparks. So when the program starts running, you know, it, it, it starts running on, a, on one process always, right? But then it finds some sparks and puts it on its own queue, right? On this processor's queue. Now the other cores, in the meanwhile, are running this idle thread, you know, that says, okay, is there something to do? Uh, no, because my queue is empty. But let me see other processors. Do they have something in the queue? Right? That they, they are not currently executing. Okay. Oh, this processor has a bunch of sparks. Let me steal one and run it. Okay? So this, these queues are actually called work stealing queues because it's easy to steal from them. Okay? <clears throat> so there is, of course, yes? Well, why is that better than having this one queue? It seems like if you have processors able to reach out and take something from any queue, then you do just as well by having a single queue and all the processors. OK, so the question is why not have a single queue, right? Well, this, this is, well, this is because of performance, really. Because if you have uh, multiple queues, uh, okay, so maybe I'll explain how these work stealing queues are implemented. This, that will be that will be easier. Um, <clears throat> so a queue, right, is something that has two ends, right? And you push stuff on one end, and you pull stuff from the other end, right? You're almost out of the frame. Who's <laughs> <laughs> stuff here? <laughs> 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 so, these work stealing queues are implemented using log free algorithms. Okay? And they are highly optimized. <clears throat> but log free does not mean that there is no synchronization, it just means that there is a very primitive synchronization, uh, non-blocking synchronization, right? So uh, if, if multiple threads have access to the same data structure, at least they have to do this uh, compare and swap, right? That's, you, that's the workhorse of um, these um, log-free data structures. You want to access something, you do compare and swap. And eventually, you know, you might want to retry it several times if, if the comparison failed. Um, but this compare and swap is an expensive operation. This is like on, on a multiprocessor, it causes some really unpleasant things like flushing the caches. Okay? Very unpleasant. Um, and it takes like, you know, a thousand cycles, hundred cycles. So it really slows the program. So these queues are designed in such a way that the, the end which is accessed by the owner processor, so there is one processor that owns this one queue, when it reaches and wants to take a spark, it reaches the, the far end of the queue and does not have to synchronize at all. Except for the boundary case when it does. But normally, if the queue is not empty or does, contains more than one element, then can take stuff from there without using cast, without using any synchronization. Okay? And that's a tremendous increase in performance. This is like, you know, they, they timed this stuff and it was like, 50% better than anything else. So that's the main reason. Now the other end of the queue, on the other hand, this is where, uh, first of all, this is where uh, new sparks are put in, right? Because it's a queue. So 
put it on one hand of the queue and pick it up, up on the other hand. But this is also the end where other processors are steering. So this is the end where actually you have to synchronize because it's accessed by multiple threads. Multiple threads running on multiple processors. Right? So that's what you have to do. So this end is synchronized, but it's not used as often as, as well, same number of times, but, <laughs> right? <laughs> but but it, it's, it's definitely an improvement. And it's also log free, so it's, it's a cast. Wait, is it the end where you put stuff in? That's the one where it is the end? The one where you put stuff. Right, so, so this, is, this is like the top of the queue. Mm -hmm. This is where you put new sparks. So this is your processor that owns this queue. This is where you put new sparks. This is where you take sparks for execution, and there's no locking here. And this is where you steal. But doesn't that mean other processors are stealing their work that has them? priority? Well, there is no priority there. So what they did actually, they tried both. Okay? They, they thought about all of this stuff <laughs> and, and uh, they didn't just, you know, no, I guess, know. right? They actually ran, uh, ran these, these uh, programs and, and compared them on, on different kinds of parallelized tasks and just found out that this is cheaper. I just think like a grocery store, right? If there's a line, uh -huh, uh -huh. you wouldn't pick the customer from the back. Yeah, and yeah. The line. yeah. So these guys keep complaining. <laughs> Somebody stole our tasks. So it's by measurement they found it was faster? Yeah. It's all measurement. And maybe it wasn't faster 100% of the time, but maybe, you know, 60% of the time. And that's enough. So the goal was the, the whole task was fast. Yeah, the, the, the whole program was fast. Specialized problems get verified. So are we assuming all those chunks are required for the same calculation? Or these these chunks that, that are here, the sparks? Yes. yes. No. Okay. Mm -hmm. They can be different. And uh, these processes might, might run completely different code. So how does it work? It always starts out with one queue and then they start stealing it at the certain server. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Exactly. And of course they also tried the, the, the one when the uh, sparks are pushed, right? So the processor creates a spark, uh, looks at, around to see is there any idle processor that I'm going to put it there, right? Uh, and then that didn't perform as well. So, you know, this, it's all about optimization because the goal of parallelism is throughput. If you don't get enough throughput, then the, your work is lost. Yeah. And do you know if there's a theoretical reason why it wasn't faster, or is that just because of current hardware architecture? It seems odd to me that like, Trump, if yeah. you have 100 processors, mm -hmm. why start with one queue when you could have more than one queue? Well, you always start. You always start on a single processor. That's, that's where you start execution, on a single processor. So the, the only choices that you have is when you're producing sparks, are you adding it to your own queue and let others who are idle steal it? Or are you, every time you produce a spark, you check other processors, are they idle? And then you distribute it. And this is just, it's just more, more work. Because these processes are, I are idle anyway. So if a process is idle, why doesn't it do some useful work, like look <laughs> looking for work, OK? So these processes are looking for work, because they are idle. Whereas if you distribute stuff yeah. actively, then the processor is actually doing something, has employment, you know, <laughs> he's wasting his time. Mm -hmm. So if a, if a spark is at the end of the queue for processor A, processor B reaches, reaches out to that end of the queue and uh, takes that spark. So this is this is my processor, the owner of this queue, right? When it's executing something and says uh, uh, some the, the user wants to run it in parallel, it just puts it on top here, right? And and just fills it up. And then when it finishes with one task, it pulls it from this end. 
Okay, so it's not only an other processor is sitting here, you know, at some point, if, if its queue is empty, it will steal. So, okay, so, so that other processor, when it generates a new spark, it puts it on its own queue? It puts it here, okay. on its queue. Right. Yeah? So when the second processor tries to steal from the first processor, is it like basically blocking itself, blocking the queue for something to be put out of the first processor? There is no blocking, this is all lock free. So, uh, is the so it's just competing here. It's competing with this. So this, this, guy, what, this guy is putting, this guy is stealing, right? Let's say the queue is empty, it's processor B, requesting processor A, is it just keep on retrying over and over again, or is it like, it's like a hole in that makes sense? Or how does it? There's no, no work to be done. If, if this is empty, if it's right? empty and it's, it's, it's trying to steal, well, well, it sees that it's empty. So, it's not so what is it, how does it know to take its next action? Like, ten, say, like, there's no, nothing at the queue. Uh, it tries to steal, it gets an empty response, and then Ray and then puts, like, another ten items on its, on its queue. Like, how does the Ray ever know to go steal again? Well, so the idle processor, uh, I don't know exactly the details, right? Because not everything is published. I would have to look into the code, right? So um, it kind of goes round robin, for, you know, around to steal work. It says uh, this process of this, because it has nothing to do, you know. There is nothing to to do, so it can just go in a loop and, and just te test all these processes. Do you have something? Do you have something? You know. Yeah, I was just curious. And if it sees it. something, it steals it. But if it doesn't, it just continues doing this. Because it's an idle processor. Yeah. Right? I guess it just seems like that would burn CPU time. You'd almost like want to like... Oh, it heats up the CPU. Put it up here. <laughs> well, that's true. Okay. So the other thing is, okay, so, so these sparks, in order to run on a processor, they have to have a thread, right? So an operating system thread. Um, operating system threads are very expensive. Very, very expensive on some operating systems, right? So the solution is to just you know, in the beginning of the program, uh, let these processors um, allocate threads from the operating system. So each of these guys actually has a thread. And this thread runs on this process. And this is the thread that's using or doing all this stuff and also doing the calculations, right? Um, so now, is it enough to have one thread per processor? It turns out, no. Because what happens is that these thunks, these sparks, when they are executed, they might want to call the operating system. For instance, doing get char, some stuff like this. And these operating system calls or external calls through foreign function interface in Haskell, right? They may block. And if a call like this blocks, then this processor is out of action. Right? So what is done by the system is just kicks out this thread before doing an FFI, foreign function. What is this Foreign function interface, okay. So when it's doing foreign function call through FFI, right, it first does the following thing. It kicks the thread out from here, gives it to, to let the operating system deal with this thread. I mean, it will be running this thread because the operating system, if it has more threads than processors, it will interleave them, 
right? So the operating system is also interleaving these processes. They are not totally owned by Haskell. <clears throat> and in fact, when they were doing the, these tests, they, they had like eight processor uh, or eight core processor. And uh, they used only seven of them for Haskell because they, they noticed that if they use all eight of them, then the operating system starts you know, randomly interacting and doing stuff that, that totally annihilates all the uh, timings. Right? So they just left one core for the operating system and they took the rest. But it doesn't mean that the operating system will not interleave stuff. So they keep the thread out, put it in, a, in some pool of threads that are uh, potentially blocking, and create a new thread. Get, get a new thread from the operating system. And when the thread returns, they, they put it back. So th there is actually a pool, thread pool, associated with every processor. They, they keep it small, right? But since allocation of new threads is very expensive, they just amortize it. So they, they keep a pool per, per processor. <clears throat> okay. Now the biggest problem, and that was the question um, from the audience, uh, is every Spark executed only once? Because now you see what, what's happening, right? It's, um, processors are kind of fighting for these thumbs, for these sparks. So if, if you wanted only one thread per thunk, per spark, you would have to have some mechanism of locking this spark. So before you start running a spark, you would lock it so that if another uh, processor wants to run it, it will see that it's already been run and wait for the result. Okay. So that would be a normal thing in, in um, imperative program. And this is why uh, parallelism on, in imperative languages suffers because, of that. because they actually have to lock it. Why do they have to lock it and we don't? Because we have pure functions, okay? So really, we could say we don't care. If two processors are, are evaluating this the same thunk, good for them, you know. Okay, it takes a little bit longer to, to do the work, the same work twice, right? But they both will produce the same result anyway, right? And they will update this thunk, you know, twice, but it doesn't matter. So that's that's a possibility. Um, but that's not the best option for performance. Because if you have a long running thumb, then eventually all the processor will, will grab it and, and start executing the same thumb. You know, and uh, <clears throat> there will be no parallelism. So there is, there is a way of doing this that's uh, a little cheaper. And that's um, by checking from time to time if two threads are executing the same time. And this is possible. This is possible because all these things are running in parallel with some other things that interrupt them. For instance, garbage collection. Okay, garbage collection is done often, at least you know, the first generation is processed very quickly uh, and often. Uh, so during garbage collection, uh, the, the, there is another task that's running through these queues and and uh, and like marking for every work queue, uh, no, for every chunk that's being executed, for every spark that's being executed, it just puts processor number in it 
say, this processor owns this calculation, owns this part. And then if another processor, and they, they check all these, right? And if another processor is trying to run the same thing, they will stop it, they will block it. So it's not done immediately. So they can run in parallel executing the same thunk for a short time, and then they are caught, and one of them is blocked. And that doesn't need to erase? Um, well, races, you know, we can avoid races by doing uh, the, the CAS instructions, you know, log free. Uh, but I think in this case, it depends on what kind of uh, garbage collector you are using. I mean, there, most garbage collectors uh, do the stop the world thing. So, at least on a single processor, they stop. Yeah. Do you ensure that you don't use like a homo that then you put string in like Okay, that's that's a that's a good question. That does this uh, I/O operation, uh, and um, so if if we have you know two threads executing the same thing and this thing contains I/O operation, will this not cause the printing of the same string twice? stuff like this, right? And the thing is that that, that um, connects to the other thing, that when you are making an external call, you know, you go on another thread. So this, this spark is removed before it makes the call, right? And when you are removing the, the spark, you can check if there is another guy who's, who's trying to do the same. So. Before, before you actually perform this operation, you check if it's not already being performed, if it's not already on this queue of um, blocked thread. Okay. Yeah? There's one thing I wanted to add, which is that it actually is possible to get into um, eagerly insert these things called black holes on the thunks, which is the thing that marks the thunk and says someone else is executing, uh, someone else is computing this thunk. Uh -huh. In that case, you can actually, uh, you can actually pass this FE, your black holing flag, to GFC, where uh, as soon as it starts executing something, it will mark it as black hole. Whereas what uh, Bartosz was describing is uh, you've got the, the garbage collector actually marking things mm -hmm. as being yeah. on both processors. Right. So. So these, these things are called black holes. You know, when, when, when a, a spark is claimed by a processor, uh, it puts a black hole in its slot saying, you know, if anybody wants to process this, they have to block. Right? But this doesn't have to be done eagerly. Doing it eagerly means you have to actually, you know, it, it just costs. It's a lot of memory. Right? Yeah. yeah. So they don't do it eagerly, they postpone it lazily, you know, because what's the worst thing that's going to happen? A few milliseconds of double work. And actually, there's something interesting that can happen, which is that one thread will be executing one thunk, and it will do some subcomputation that's required for evaluating the overall thunk, and the other thread will see that progress mm -hmm. and potentially use the, the results. So there's a lot of little tricks there. Okay. So I think this is a good place to stop. And the next time we'll finally get into the eval monad that actually implements this parallelism. And we can write some parallel programs for the first time and time them. OK, thank you.